Artlaw TV presents a cultural commons, alternative approaches to copyright and the distribution of material. Um, well, Ben and I have worked together for about seven years um, uh, with the Project Open Music Archive. Prior to that, we were working um, separately as artists. I was working with film and video, uh, working a lot with editing and sampling and uh, taping things off the telly and all sorts of different ways of working with material. And Ben was working as a DJ and sound artist, um, reconfiguring archive material and working with ways of remixing material. And um, we both find that we were found that we were kind of exceeding the limits of what was allowed uh, under copyright law. So um, we decided to think about how we might work together on a new project. Um, and the new project we wanted to work on was something that worked with public domain material. There's no one place, one catalogue you can look at to really look at what's in the public domain. Um, so we had to cross-reference lots of catalogues and databases and um, look into various different public archives to try and find out, uh, find material that we could work with. Um, so the Open Music Archive kind of came out of, of that. We, we, we felt that having done all this research, we wanted to make that material available. Just because something is accessible to you on the internet, on the web or somebody's website or whatever or you see it in the street doesn't mean it's in the public domain public domain is a jargonistic legal word which means that any intellectual property rights in the work like copyright or design rights or trademarks uh, or patents any intellectual property rights protecting the work against economic exploitation have expired so the open music archive um, contains all the research uh, we've been doing, gathering together public domain music recordings. Um, and these recordings are mainly um, 1920s and 30s jazz, blues, folk and musical from the beginnings of the recording industry. And that's due to uh, this thin slither of availability due to the copyright laws. You have to go back 70 years from the death of the author and 50 years from the date of recording. You have copyright, for example, take Elton John, who writes the music for the songs that he records. And that would last for his lifetime plus 50 or 70 years, depending on the country. In Europe, it's 70 years after death. Then you get Bernie Taupin, who writes the lyrics, and he would be the copyright owner of those lyrics for his lifetime plus 70 years after death. But then you've got the record label that's responsible for the recording, the sound recording, and there is a special copyright called the sound recording copyright for the record label. And that length of time for the record label uh, of copyright in the sound recording lasts for generally around the world 50 years from the date of its release in most countries. Eileen Simpson and Ben White digitised the out of copyright sound recordings. This does not give rise to new copyright works, but they do own and control the digitised versions and how these are distributed. For example, a commercial organisation might charge for access to the digitised material, which is made available for free as MP3s in the Open Music Archive. We work as a kind of project-based um, initiative. Um, it's uh, it's peer-to-peer, -peer. It's, uh, it's a website, it's a resource. So there might be many ways in which you might want to interact with the material that's available um, in the archive. Um, we have recently done a series of remix projects and um, reconfigurations where we've invited people to um, collaborate with us. But we've also, um, you know, people can access uh, the material on the website and download that and it's freely available. One of the projects to emerge from the Open Music Archive was Free to Air. Um, Free to Air is an interesting project um, to talk about um, as a way to talk about the Open Music Archive because it's um, often a project that we'll uh, work with with the Open Music Archive will kind of emerge from a series of um, what ifs. So, you know, what if we were to take some music box recordings from uh, turn of the century music boxes, digitise the music, and um, re reconfigure it as a, a as a new digital um, recording? 
or what if we were to uh, separate the lyrics from the melody and explore what might happen in to make a new com composition in terms of the rights um, that are assigned to each of those elements. And um, the Free to Air project grew out of a, a sort of what if we were to um, re-perform these compositions in the context of the gallery um, on a temporary radio station. Yeah, so we were interested in the gallery space as a social space, but we were also interested in radio as a kind of public uh, broadcast in that, you know, radio broadcasts out into public space and it's kind of freely available but at the same time the spectrum the radio spectrum is highly um, highly uh, controlled and it's very difficult to get access to the FM radio spectrum so we, we had the opportunity to broadcast on the radio um, and we wanted to kind of open up a, an open channel for for public domain music where we were playing all the tracks from the archive the 1920s and 30s tracks uh, but also inviting bands into the gallery um, to perform short 15 minute sets, not of the music they normally play, but of their kind of specific interpretations of these 20s and 30s blues, folk, jazz, and music hall. Just remember me, baby, when I'm in six feet of cocoa ground. When out of copyright sound recordings are reinterpreted and re recorded, me, this will generally give rise to new copyright works. Eileen Simpson and Ben White's practice challenges a more conventional approach where the copyright owner asserts copyright ownership. Well, I'll remember you, baby, when you're in six um, feet Yeah, and I would say that um, the labels and artists that got involved in the project were pretty much all of them were very much interested in the ethos of the project. The invitation um, that we extended to all of these artists was... Um, absolutely framed in the idea that there would be a copyleft licensed recording made and this would be then made freely available to be used and built upon in the future. The open source or the Creative Commons movement uses the existence of copyright by saying this work is available through the web on the internet for free without having to pay a license fee or get specific permissions to be able to do what you want with the work usually on a non-commercial basis but often there are licenses uh, from creative commons or open source um, uh, suppliers who say it's okay if you use it on a commercial basis but that is less so and so the thinking behind it has been free use, free access, the sharing of information, images, sounds, you know, information uh, generally uh, by uh, as many people as possible. There are several forms of open licence. In Free to Air, participants agree to make new works available under a Creative Commons attribution share-alike licence. Uh, the material's left open for anybody to use for any purpose, and that might be commercial or non-commercial, it might be... Uh, to remix it, but the thing that the kind of the viral seed in the license, which is most important for us, is is the share alike aspect of it, which is which means that um, the material is left open. So if people use the material on the on the site, which is copyleft licensed, they in turn have to use um, the same license with their new new work. So it kind of keeps the material open and kind of generates this kind of viral logic which um, uh, yeah which uh, encourages the, the, the uh, distribution of the material rather than locks it down. I think one of the things that we want to do um, with the Open Music Archive is to invite people to actively engage with ideas um, about ownership and control and to think about how they might sort of donate their contribution or that they might think about their creative work um, in relation to this idea um, and how their creative output or creative contributions relate to um, knowledge economies and how they um, might possibly rethink their position or actively engage with the questions of their position in relation um, to these ideas. Open licenses support a cultural commons by ensuring that works are free from at least some copyright restrictions 
and by imposing a return obligation which ensures that new works are free to use in the same way. For further details of this programme and other programmes by Artlaw TV, please go to www.artquest.org.uk.